Roto. Imagine making a film so iconic that it's almost wiped off the face of the earth. Well, that's the story of Nosferatu. It's a vampire film so daring that in 1925, a German court ordered that every copy be destroyed. Because it was an unauthorized adaptation of Dracula, the famous novel. Hey, future me here. Since Nosferatu is a knockoff of the novel, I'll use the first legal film adaptation as a visual representation instead of the book. F.W. Murnau was obsessed with immortality and the supernatural. He perfected what would become one of the most influential works in gothic horror. His inspiration was Bram Stoker's Dracula, a gothic horror novel about a young lawyer named Jonathan Harker who battles the ancient vampire Count Dracula. In the novel, Dracula is determined to move to England and spread his undead curse. But what Murnau didn't realize at the time was that his version was destined to haunt audiences and almost disappear forever. Murnau's fascination with immortality likely had something to do with his experiences as a pilot in World War I. After surviving a war that claimed the lives of about 16 million people, it's easy to see why Murnau might have wanted to explore life beyond death. The war left a lot of people grappling with the fragility of life, and it's no surprise that someone like Murnau, who saw so much death firsthand, would want to dig into the supernatural, and that's exactly what he did with Nosferatu. But the real turning point for Nosferatu wasn't just Murnau's obsession. It was Albin Gro, an artist and occultist who pitched the idea to Murnau in 1921. Albin had deep interest in the occult and mystical societies, so he saw Dracula as the perfect base for a film that could bring his supernatural vision to life. However, instead of going the usual route and securing permission, Gra and Murnau decided to make a quick pivot and turn Dracula into Nosferatu with just enough tweaks to avoid the copyright issues that could have sunk the whole project. You see, in the late 19th century, Europe was having a gothic revival. People were fascinated by dark, mysterious things, ghosts, monsters, vampires, and Bram Stoker's novel Dracula was smack dab in the middle of all of it. Stoker spent seven years writing it, pulling from everything he could find about vampires, superstition, and of course, the infamous Vlad the Impaler. Vlad was a 15th century ruler who had a reputation for cruelty. Stoker used Vlad's brutal reputation to create Count Dracula, a character who would go on to become one of the most iconic villains in fiction. When Dracula hit the shelves, it didn't exactly blow up. It got mixed reviews, with some praising its suspense and others calling it over the top. But here's the thing, while it wasn't a huge commercial hit, Dracula had carved out a niche for itself, and eventually it caught the attention of people like Albin Graw, who saw the potential for a movie adaptation. Only Graw didn't ask for permission. Because a lot of this happened over 100 years ago, I'll use scenes from Shadow of the Vampire to help tell this story. Friedrich, Friedrich, we have to talk about the vampire. Not now, Albin. Albin Graw was also a World War I veteran, and like many soldiers, he came back with some unique interests after the war. He got heavily into the occult and even joined several mystical societies. It's safe to say that Graw wasn't your average guy, and he wasn't just making movies for the sake of profit. He believed in the supernatural and wanted to bring it to life on the big screen. What is the most wondrous thing you have ever seen? I saw ectoplasm once. Ectoplasm? What is ectoplasm? It's the mystical substance of ghosts. I saw a spiritualist pull it out of his mouth in Italy. In 1921, Albin co-founded a film company called Prana Film. It's named after the Sanskrit word for life force. Very on brand for someone who's into the occult. The company's sole purpose was to make supernatural films. The first and only movie they ever made was Nosferatu. When Albin Graw and F.W. Murnau linked up, they never bothered to get the rights to Dracula. They just changed a few names and hoped no one would notice. Strictly speaking, this is not Dracula. The author's widow wouldn't sell us the rights to the novel. 
So who's playing Count Dracula? I mean, uh, Orlok. Spoiler alert, people noticed. Once Nosferatu was completed, it was released in 1922. And surprise, surprise, the Stoker estate wasn't too happy. Florence Stoker, Bram's widow, was in charge of protecting her husband's legacy. And she wasn't about to let some German film studio rip off Dracula. So in 1923, she took Prana Film to court, accusing them of copyright infringement. Florence Stoker argued that all the key elements were the same. The characters, the plot structure, even specific scenes. Take Count Dracula. He became Count Orlok. Instead of the suave, aristocratic appearance of Dracula, Orlok was reimagined as something far more grotesque and animalistic. Picture a bald, rat-like figure with sharp claws and fangs that look more like they belong to a rodent than a dignified vampire. Orlok's look, while unforgettable, is far from the sophisticated image of Dracula that many people recognize today. In Dracula, Harker's a young solicitor who travels to Transylvania to assist Dracula with his move to London. In Nosferatu, Harker becomes Thomas Hutter, and his job is pretty much the same. He heads off to Orlok's castle to close a real estate deal for him. But as Hutter arrives at the castle, he's already being warned by locals, much like Harker who receives ominous warnings about the dangers that lie ahead. Both Hutter and Harker ignore these warnings, and soon enough, they're both trapped in the vampire's lair. Speaking of which, Mina Harker becomes Ellen Hutter in Nosferatu. Much like Mina, Ellen is the real estate solicitor's wife and she too becomes crucial in putting an end to the vampire's reign of terror. In both stories, the vampire fixates on the protagonist's love interest, and in both, she plays a pivotal role in the vampire's eventual destruction. And then there's Renfield, Dracula's insane servant who is reimagined as Nock in Nosferatu. Nock, like Renfield, becomes completely unhinged and serves as the intermediary between the vampire and the world, helping set the stage for the vampire's journey to spread terror. Nock's role is eerily similar to Renfield's, even down to the madness he displays. Now let's talk about the plot, because while Nosferatu might try to change a few names, the story's structure is almost identical to Dracula. First, in Dracula, Harker travels to Transylvania to meet Dracula. In Nosferatu, Hutter does the same, traveling to the Carpathian Mountains to finalize the sale of a house for Orlok. And of course, both Harker and Hutter are warned by the locals about the dangers of going to the vampire's castle. But in classic horror movie fashion, neither one listens to the warnings and they both end up as prisoners in the castle. After they realize what's going on, Hutter escapes back to Wisborg, while Harker makes his way back to England. But it's not just the castle escape that ties the stories together. Both vampires, Dracula and Orlok, travel by ship to spread their influence. In Dracula, the Count sails to England, causing terror and death along the way. Orlok similarly travels by ship to Wisborg, leaving a trail of death behind him as the crew mysteriously dies one by one. But it's not just the journey that mirrors each other, it's the plague-like influence of both vampires. In Nosferatu, Orlok's arrival brings a literal plague to Westburg, symbolized by rats and disease. It's a clear nod to Dracula, where the vampire's presence brings death and sickness to London. Both vampires are more than just creatures of the night. They are representations of a larger, almost contagious evil that spreads throughout society. Something that corrupts not just individuals, but entire populations. Finally, the climactic moments in both films are driven by the sacrifice of the protagonist's wife. In Dracula, Mina falls under Dracula's spell, and her connection with him becomes the key to stopping him. In Nosferatu, Ellen recognizes that only her willingness to sacrifice herself can stop Orlok. She lures him into her room, staying awake all night to make sure he's distracted by her and loses track of time. The sacrifice of her purity ultimately leads to Orlok's destruction when the sunlight breaks through the window and kills him. This moment aligns with later vampire lore, which would establish that vampires are vulnerable to sunlight, though this wasn't something Stoker explicitly included in his novel. 
Fast forward to today and we're getting a Nosferatu remake from Robert Eggers, the director behind The Witch and The Lighthouse. And honestly, if there's anyone who can do justice to the eerie atmosphere of the original, it's Eggers. If Nosferatu's wild journey from plagiarism to cultural treasure is fascinating to you, then you'll definitely want to check out this next video about spaghetti sci-fi movies. It's a whole other underrated corner of cinema that's just as fun to get into.